In 1913, the journalist George Sims wrote to the by then retired Chief Inspector John Littlechild seeking information about a particular Jack the Ripper suspect. At the time of the Whitechapel murders, Littlechild had been head of the Metropolitan Police's Special Irish Branch, a department that had been set up to fight the ever-present threat of Fenian terrorism throughout the 1880s. Although Littlechild, as far as can be ascertained, had had little to do with the Jack the Ripper investigation itself, as a high-ranking officer in the Metropolitan Police, he most certainly would have had frequent contact with the detectives who were working on the case, and he would therefore have been privy to many of the lines of inquiry that they were pursuing. Sims was curious as to whether Littlechild had any knowledge of a Dr. D having been suspected of carrying out the murders. In his reply, dated the 23rd of September 1913, Littlechild stated that I have never heard of a Dr. D in connection with the Whitechapel murders, but amongst the suspects, and to my mind a very likely one, was a Dr. T, which sounds much like D. He was an American quack named Tumblety and was, at one time, a frequent visitor to London and on these occasions constantly brought under the notice of police, there being a large dossier concerning him at Scotland Yard. Although a psychopathia sexualis, he was not known as a sadist, which the murderer unquestionably was. But his feelings toward women were remarkable and bitter in the extreme, a fact on record. Tumblety was arrested at the time of the murders in connection with unnatural offences and charged at Marlborough Street. Remanded on bail, jumped his bail and got away to Boulogne. He shortly left Boulogne and was never heard of afterwards. It was believed he committed suicide, but certain it is that from this time the Ripper murders came to an end. The suspect to whom Little Child was referring was Dr. Francis Tumblety, who had been arrested in London in November 1888 and whose name had at the time been linked to the murders by many American newspapers, albeit the English press appear to have paid him scant attention. Reporting on his arrest in its edition of Sunday the 18th of November 1888, the San Francisco Chronicle had this to say, albeit they managed to misspell his name. Another arrest was a man who gave the name of Dr. Cumblety of New York. The police could not hold him on suspicion of the Whitechapel crimes, but he will be committed for trial at the Central Criminal Court under the special law passed soon after the modern Babylon exposures. The police say this is the man's right name as proved by letters in his possession, that he is from New York and that he has been in the habit of crossing the ocean twice a year for several years. The next day, the New York Times, managing to spell his name correctly this time, reported that The Dr. Tumblety, who was arrested in London a few days ago on suspicion of complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and who, when proved innocent of that charge, was held for trial in the Central Criminal Court under the special law covering the offences disclosed in the late modern Babylon scandal, will be remembered by any number of Brooklynites and New Yorkers as Dr. Blackburn, the Indian herb doctor. He is the fellow who, in 1861, burst upon the people of Brooklyn as a sort of modern Count of Monte Cristo. He was of striking personal appearance, being considerably over six feet in height, of graceful and powerful build, with strongly marked features, beautifully clear complexion, a sweeping moustache and jet black hair. He went dashing about the streets mounted on a handsome, light chestnut horse and dressed in the costliest and most elaborate riding costumes and soon had a stream of customers at his office and laboratory on Fulton Street near the City Hall. In these rides he was invariably accompanied by a valet as handsomely apparelled and horsed as himself and a brace of superb English greyhounds. It is therefore apparent that Dr. Francis Tumblety was arrested on suspicion of being involved in the Whitechapel murders, albeit he was ultimately charged under the 1885 
Criminal Law Amendment Act, which had made gross indecency between males a specific criminal offence. This, incidentally, is what Little Child was referring to when he stated that Tumble Tea was a psychopathia sexualis. Having been released on bail, which was put up by two of his acquaintances, Tumble Tea fled to France, from whence he set sail for New York, where he was kept under surveillance by officers of the NYPD. Tumble Tea's name does, therefore, belong on the list of suspects, and research into him is an important part of the history of the Whitechapel murders, if only in order to find out how and why he came to be arrested. One person who has carried out extensive study on Tumble Tea is the author Michael L. Hawley, whose books, The Ripper's Haunts and Jack the Ripper Suspect, Dr. Francis Tumble Tea, are essential reading for those wishing to study the case. Michael is the go-to guy when it comes to Tumble Tea, so I sought his assistance as I began work on this video, and he graciously agreed to help tell the story of one of the most intriguing and eccentric characters associated with the Jack the Ripper case. I began by asking him who exactly Dr. Francis Tumble Tea was. Well, Francis Tumble Tea was uh, ultimately a quack doctor, but he was actually born in, uh, in Ireland in 1830 and one of 11 children, he was the 11th. And some of his family members had already moved to America because before the potato famine, there were still issues going on in Ireland. And so some of the family members had already moved and the Northeast of the United States was uh, experiencing a boom and a boon in uh, the economy, thanks to the Erie Canal. And so that's where his brother Lawrence and a sister moved to Rochester, New York. So, but by 1847, when the, the big trash of you know, the uh, potato famine went to its peak, uh, that, that's when Francis came over with his mother, father, and a, and a brother. And then they eventually moved to Rochester. And then in the next nine years, he was in Rochester, but he got involved with some quack doctors, uh, different kinds. But eventually it was an Indian herb doctor, a uh, uh, guy named Lyons. But what happened was, is 1856, he started on his own, crossed the border into Canada. They called it Canada West at the time, but it was, it's Ontario. Went into a town called London, coincidentally, and started his business. Within three years, he became a millionaire by today's standards. He was so good at his quack doctor business. And it was truly a quack doctor business because his goal was really to exploit money. And he did it the best. And I've recently uncovered some some uh, court documents on how he did it, which was really intriguing, but he was, re he was the best. But by, by, Lund uh, by three years, he had $60,000, which is over a million dollars today's value in the Toronto bank within three years. So then he was independently wealthy, could do anything he want, traveled through Canada, and then made more money, but he also got himself into quite a bit of trouble and eventually came to the United States and uh, tried to continue his quack doctor business, at least until about the uh, 1870s. And that's, he kind of semi-retired. But, uh, and of course, he's got himself into so many issues. But eventually, by uh, the early 1870s, he started taking trips to London at least once or twice a year. And that's kind of how we got involved with him being in the uh, Whitechapel District in 1888. Tumble Tea actually arrived in England in the early 1870s, and by 1874 he had set himself up in business at 177 Duke Street, Liverpool, where he advertised his arrival in the local newspapers. Good news for the afflicted. The great American doctor from British America has arrived and can be consulted at 177 Duke Street. His adverts were, to say the least, verbose. This one, for example, appeared in the Liverpool Mercury on Saturday the 15th of August 1874 and featured a poetic motto grandly written in the third person to advertise the services that he offered. We use such balms as have no strife with nature or the laws of life. With blood our hands we never stain nor poison men to ease their pain. Our Father, who all goodness fills, provides the means to cure all ills. The simple herbs beneath our feet, well used, relieve our pains complete. A simple herb, a simple flower, culled from the dewy lee, these shall speak with touching power of change and health to thee. 
On Saturday the 29th of August, he managed to secure an editorial in the Liverpool Weekly Courier, which began, Who is the great American doctor? is a question often asked. Well, this celebrated physician has in his possession... The article then went on to provide an impressive list of those whose letters he possessed, and it must be said it was a pretty impressive line-up that included General Robert E. Lee, the Sultan of Turkey, not to mention the late Abraham Lincoln and the late Charles Dickens, to name but a few. By Saturday, November the 7th, 1874, Tomati's practice was apparently doing a roaring trade, and he was able to publish a long list of testimonials from satisfied clients in the Liverpool Weekly Courier. Mr J Murphy, for example, was fulsome in his praise when he wrote, May heaven's richest blessing ever be showered on the great American doctor of 177 Duke Street, whose medicine has cured me of indigestion, liver complaint, great weakness, etc. A. Green of 3 Slaney Street claimed that, having been given up to die by all the doctors, he or she had been raised from the grave by the great American. John Doyle of Pepper Street had been blind for over six years, but the great American doctor had cured him. Pimples, ulcerated legs, scrofula, scurvy, heart disease, consumption, you name it, the great American doctor had cured it. On January the 1st, 1875, Tumblety saw in the new year with a typically modest advert in the Liverpool Mercury. The reason why. Why is the great American doctor successful? 1. Because he is one of the few mortals to whom the divine gift of healing seems to have descended as a legitimate inheritance. 2. Because he has investigated every remedy known to science, and in addition has new remedies from the fields and forests of his own discovery, and of the greatest possible efficacy and value. 3. Because he has no routine way of treating all cases alike, but treats each patient who sacredly commits his health to his care according to the actual condition of each patient. 4. Because, having made a speciality of liver, lung and blood diseases, he has an experience which extended to tens of thousands of cases, a greater experience, it is safe to say, than any other other living man. 5. Because he selects his remedies for each case with such care, uses harmless vegetable agents, and devotes his whole life and energies to making his practice successful to get his patients thoroughly and permanently cured. The doctor will describe disease and tell persons the nature of their complaints or illness without receiving any information from them. No charge for consultation. Office. 177 Duke Street. Over the next few days, Tumblety took out numerous adverts in the Liverpool Mercury, many of them featuring testimonials that made ever more elaborate claims. One person who read Tumblety's adverts was Edward Hanratty, a railway worker who had been ill for two years with congestion of the lungs and heart disease, neither of which were helped by his heavy drinking. His own doctor had not been able to alleviate his symptoms so he decided to pay the great American doctor a visit to see if he could help. Hanratty and his wife arrived at Tumblety's office on the morning of the 11th of January. On examining Hanratty, Tumblety, having tapped him on the chest, told him that he was suffering from shortness of breath and undertook to cure him for the sum of two pounds ten shillings. He afterwards reduced his fee to thirty shillings, and when this was paid, he handed Mrs Hanratty a bottle of medicine, lots of pills and some herbs, as well as instructions on how she should administer them to her husband. At about five o'clock that evening, Mrs Hanratty gave her husband a tablespoon of the medicine. Shortly afterwards, Mr Hanratty broke out in a cold sweat, suffered two fainting fits, and, at nine o'clock that night, he died. The next day, Mrs Hanratty went to see Dr. Tumblety to ask for a death certificate, and she was somewhat taken aback when he denied any knowledge of the case. He did, however, return the 30 shillings, although he was careful to take back all the medicines he had provided. Mrs Hanratty then applied to their original medic, Dr Bly, for a death certificate. On hearing that the patient had been treated by Tumblety, he too refused to issue a death certificate, but instead reported the death to the coroner, meaning that an inquest now had to be held.
Dr. Bly then performed a post-mortem on the deceased and invited Tumblety to be present. Tumblety failed to turn up. However, a few days later, Bly and Tumblety did meet to discuss the case, and Bly later testified that Tumblety had told him that he knew nothing of diseases, only having come to Liverpool to make money to enable him to recover some property in Canada. At the inquest, Tumblety was represented by Mr Murphy, who stated that his client had complained to him that he could not expect any appreciation at the hands of an English jury. Furthermore, he protested, his client had been informed that the jury had been tampered with. The coroner responded that Tumblety should have attended court in person. He also rebuked Mr Murphy for constantly referring to his client as the American doctor. Whether Mr Tumblety was an American or not, the coroner observed, was of no importance. It was of far more consequence to know whether he was a doctor or not. The question that the coroner wanted answered was whether the medicine that Tumblety had provided had been responsible for Edward Hanratty's death, and Dr Bly testified that he had found no trace of poison, but if there had been an opiate in the mixture, this could have injured the deceased and not be detectable after death. In his summing up, the coroner commented in strong terms about Tumblety charging 30 shillings for an article which probably was not worth 30 pence. He could, he said, only ascribe it to Tumblety's eagerness to get money, which could not be too strongly condemned. The jury returned a verdict of death from natural causes, but they left it an open question as to whether or not it was accelerated by unskillful treatment. They strongly censured the conduct of Mr Tumblety in administering medicine, he being in total ignorance of the condition of his patient. The coroner and the jury were evidently deeply suspicious that Tumblety was not, as he had been claiming, a qualified doctor. It also transpired around this time that the glowing testimonials about him that were appearing in the Liverpool newspapers might not be genuine. At the same time as he was being censured in the coroner's court, Tumblety was also being sued for libel at the Liverpool County Court. The plaintiff in the case was William Carroll of 2 George's Road, Liverpool, who sought £200 in damages, claiming that Tumblety had slandered him in one of his adverts. According to the Liverpool Mercury, the plaintiff charged the defendant with falsely and maliciously printing and publishing the following advertisement. My face was covered with pimples and blotches and my blood was very impure. The great American doctor of 177 Duke Street has cured me. William Carroll, 2 George's Road, West Derby Road, Liverpool. As it happened, neither Carroll nor Tumblety appeared in court on the day of the hearing, and the registrar, Mr Heim, instructed that the case be struck out. Not one to let the exposure that the newspaper coverage was affording him go to waste, Tumblety set to work on an updated autobiography, and let the good people of Liverpool know about it in an advert that he placed in the Liverpool Mercury on Thursday the 4th of February 1875. Who is the great American doctor? In the press, and will shortly be ready, passages from the life of Dr Francis Tumblety in pamphlet form. The pamphlet would be available in July 1875, and eager purchasers could obtain their copies post-free by sending sixpence to 58 Margaret Street, Cavendish Square, London. Ominously, given Tumblety's track record in Liverpool, his adverts for the publication included the promise that purchasers would receive advice and medicine immediately. By this time, Tumblety had decided that it was time to move on from Liverpool, and on the morning of Wednesday the 11th of August, the residents of Birmingham opened their newspapers to find the announcement. Good news for the afflicted! The great American doctor from British America has arrived and can be consulted at 50 Union Passage, Birmingham. The doctor will describe disease and tell persons the nature of their complaints or illness without receiving any information from them. No charge for consultation or advice. Thereafter, Tomity began to divide his time between England and America, his grandiose advertisements appearing less and less, until by the 1880s they had stopped altogether. Right about 1880, uh, well, when he went to England or Europe for a while, came back, you don't see any more advertising. He never advertised again. 
But you could see trying to be in the limelight was only a, a financial decision, a business decision that worked. And then, but once he was done doing that, you don't see that. In the 1880s, the threat of Fenian terrorism increased in the UK, and the secret department, which would later become the Special Irish Branch, of which Chief Inspector John Littlechild was the head from 1883, strove to counter it. This could have been how Littlechild became aware of Tumblety, who, as a wealthy Irish American, may have been a useful source of finance to the various Fenian factions. But would the Fenians have been interested in Tumblety? Well, the there is definitely that a reason why the Fenians would have taken an interest in Tumblety. He was a rich Irish American that traveled a lot. So now what I see, especially in the 1870s, uh, that I could see Tumblety trying to take advantage of them. One of the things that Tumblety always did was take advantage of anything, any opportunities. I just don't see him championing the cause. So but I do see him trying to take advantage of the Fenians, but I think the Fenians would have figured him out in the 1870s. And I, so I'm, I'm convinced that they contacted each other, but I, I think the Fenians realized this guy is a little, little more uh, narcissistic than they could handle. <laughs> Throughout the 1880s, Tumblety, as Little Child stated in his letter to the Sims, visited London several times a year, albeit he appears to have kept a low profile as far as the press was concerned. We do know that he was in the habit of employing young men as secretaries, both in London and America, and that he also had relationships with several of them. One of those young men was Martin H. McGarry, who was employed by Tumblety in 1882. McGarry lived with Tumblety for a long time, and he also accompanied him on his travels. After Tumblety had returned to New York following his arrest in 1888, McGarry who by that time was a successful businessman, thanks, he said, to Tumblety's kindness, gave an interview to the New York World, in which he spoke about Tumblety's aversion to women. He always disliked women very much. He used to say to me, Martin, no women for me. He could not bear to have them near him. He thought all women were impostors, and he often said that all the trouble in this world was caused by women. Intriguingly, despite his dislike for and bitterness towards women, Tumblety, quite literally, had a strong feminine side to him. And while well, Tumblety, he was actually a hermaphrodite, so he was, had an intersex condition. So, so he, uh, the Baltimore attorney said that he had both male and female parts, basically. You know, his, he had, uh, his hips were female, his hands were female, he had an effeminate voice, but his shoulders and his height and his mustache were male. So, you know, it was already confused there, but he identified as a male, at least publicly. At some stage prior to the onset of the Jack the Ripper murders in 1888, Tumblety arrived in London, albeit the date of his arrival is unknown. He had certainly arrived by July because the first count of gross indecency with which he was later charged was dated the 27th of July. The second count was on the 31st of August, the same day on which the murder of Mary Nichols, who is widely believed to have been the first of Jack the Ripper's victims, took place. The third count was on the 14th of October, and the final one was on the 2nd of November. But how did he come to be arrested on suspicion of being the Whitechapel murderer? In early 1889, Tumblety gave an interview to an American newspaper in which he explained how he came to be suspected of the crimes. My arrest came about in this way. I had been going over to England for a long time, ever since 1869 indeed, and I used to go about the city a great deal, until every part of it became familiar to me. I happened to be there when the Whitechapel murders attracted the attention of the whole world, and in company with thousands of other people, I went down to the Whitechapel district. I was not dressed in a way to attract attention, I thought, though it afterwards turned out that I was. I was interested by the excitement, the crowds and the queer scenes and sights and I did not know that all the time I was being followed by English detectives. Why did they follow you? the journalist asked. My guilt was very plain to the English mind. Someone had said that Jack the Ripper was an American and everybody believed that statement. Then it is the universal belief among the lower classes that all Americans wear slouch hats. Therefore, Jack the Ripper must wear a slouch hat. Now, 
I happen to have one, and this, together with the fact that I was an American, was enough for the police. It established my guilt beyond any question. Tumblety's press interview reveals that, unbeknownst to him, he had become a person of interest to the Metropolitan Police at the time of the Whitechapel murders, and he was being followed by detectives. This was corroborated by John Littlechild in his reply to George Sims's letter, in which he stated that on his visits to London, Tumblety was constantly brought under the notice of police, there being a large dossier concerning him at Scotland Yard. Of course, it is impossible now to say with any degree of certainty that the police were following him because they suspected him of being involved in the Whitechapel murders. The reason for their interest in him could have been in connection with his Fenian sympathies or even his activities with young men and would certainly have been recorded on the large dossier concerning him which Little Child stated was held at Scotland Yard, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police. Unfortunately and frustratingly, that dossier has never been accessed or even unearthed by researchers on the case. There is likely a file on Tumbledy because Tumbledy was active in the 1870s right to the 1880s getting himself in trouble. So he was, he was getting arrested. So they had to have had a, just a regular CID, you know, file on him because he was arrested and they were even in London. It might, could be an illusion that it was little child and that uh, he was the chief inspector of special branch, that the file was in special, Tumbley's files in special branch. That might be just an illusion. What is certain, however, is that at some stage in the autumn of 1888, Tumulty was arrested in connection with the Whitechapel murders, and that the police, for whatever reason, had had him under surveillance prior to his arrest. Since the whereabouts of the police file on him is unknown, and the British newspapers gave virtually no coverage to his apprehension, trying to connect the various pieces of the puzzle behind his arrest can now be little more than speculation. Take, for example, the startling revelations that were made at the inquest into the death of Annie Chapman. On Wednesday the 26th of September, the final day of the inquest proceedings, the coroner, Wynne Edwin Baxter, having noted the fact that two cheap brass rings had been wrenched from Annie Chapman's fingers, caused a sensation when he announced that the real object of the murderer may have been specifically to obtain the uterus which was missing from Annie Chapman's body. There were no meaningless cuts. The organ had been removed by someone who knew where to find it and how to remove it without causing injury to it. No unskilled person could have known where to find it or have recognised it when it was found. It must have been someone accustomed to the post-mortem room. The conclusion that the desire was to possess the missing abdominal organ seems overwhelming. Baxter went on to inform the inquest that it was clear that there was a market for the missing organ and to back up this assertion, he revealed that he had received a communication from the sub-curator of the Pathological Museum of a London medical school stating that Some months ago, an American had called on him and had asked him to procure a number of specimens of the organ that was missing from the deceased. He stated his willingness to give £20 apiece for each specimen. He stated that his object was to issue an actual specimen with each copy of a publication on which he was then engaged. He was told that his request was impossible to be complied with, but still urged his request. He wished them preserved, not in spirits of wine, the usual medium, but in glycerine, in order to preserve them in a flaccid condition, and he wished them sent to America direct. It is known that this request was repeated to another institution of a similar character. It is important to stress that Baxter did not, as is sometimes stated, accuse the American of being the murderer. He simply raised the possibility that the offer of such a substantial reward might have induced somebody to carry out the crime in order to obtain the womb of the victim for financial gain. It should also be noted that various doctors were quick to denounce Baxter's assertions and there were press reports that the request had been made more than a year ago and that the doctor in question had been traced and, having been found to offer impeccable credentials, was exonerated of having had any involvement in the crimes. It has been suggested that Tumulty may have been the doctor in question, albeit it must be said the suggestion is nothing more than speculation. However, with the newspapers going into overdrive over Coroner Baxter's inquest revelations, the possibility that the murderer may have possessed medical knowledge and that he might be an American became rooted in the public consciousness, 
and thus, as Tumblety stated in his press interview of January 1889, many people began to believe that Jack the Ripper was an American. When the police made public the Dear Boss Jack the Ripper letter in early October 1888, it was noted that it contained several Americanisms, and thus its release led to further suspicions that the perpetrator of the crimes might be an American, a prospect that was fuelled by several newspaper stories that appeared throughout October. On Sunday the 7th of October, an article that appeared in the Chicago Tribune contained an intriguing snippet of information that if true, could place Tumblety in the Whitechapel district at the time of the murders. An American who used to live in New York keeps a herb shop now in the Whitechapel district. A detective called at his place this week and asked him if he had sold any unusual compound of herbs to a customer since August. Similar inquiries were made at other shops in the neighbourhood. An American who used to live in New York and who kept a herb shop would fit Tumblety to a T, but sadly the story didn't go into further detail, and thus it is impossible to know if the shopkeeper was Tumblety. There were several reports throughout October of Americans being arrested in connection with the crimes, but no names were given, and each of the detainees was released after having given satisfactory accounts of themselves. There were also newspaper reports that the police were watching steamers leaving for America from Liverpool in the belief that the murderer would attempt to escape from the country via Liverpool. Any or none of these people could have been Tumblety. We simply do not know. A point that is often made against Tumblety's having been the murderer is the fact that he was described as having been a very tall and striking man who dressed flamboyantly and would therefore have stuck out like a sore thumb in Victorian Whitechapel. But was that description accurate? The, one of the things that he reported that in that uh, January 1889 interview with the New York World is he, he dressed as to not bring attention to himself. And when he, uh, every time that he would go at night into the slums, everywhere he went, even in Rochester, a couple of years after the murders, Here's the, the neighbor of Tumblety saying Tumblety in the city of Rochester in a kind of a dark area, very similar to where Martha Tabram was murdered uh, in at the stairs. And Tumblety is sitting with his hands on the wall still like this. And she knows it's Tumblety because she knows who Tumblety is, but it was still dark and he was silent. <laughs> and so she walks by. And that was just a couple years after the murders. So here's Tumblety. Um, one of the things about when they say now, again, Sometimes people report that he's six foot four. No, this is a world of hats. And if you look at when, the, let's say the average is person is five foot seven, and you look at those older pictures, it's not that everybody's five foot seven. It's a bell curve. There's taller people and shorter people. It's the average. So Tumbley would not have stuck out like a sore thumb with his height because he fits in that bell curve. It wasn't like he was six, five or seven feet tall. And then so, and he was good at dressing down. And that's what we see that he dressed down. He even said that he dressed down. And uh, so, and he, he would have not stuck out like a sore thumb. Another argument often raised to dismiss Tumblety's candidature as the perpetrator of the Whitechapel murders is that gay serial killers only tend to target other men. I think that's a valid point. Uh, and I remember Martin Fido brought that up years ago. And I remember when Martin Fido was the keynote speaker in Baltimore and I was one of those subordinate speakers, he, we had a beautiful discussion on that. And I had Martin Fido nodding his head like this. So what happened was is the, if, if Jack the Ripper was a sadosexual serial, serial killer like John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, then Tumblety likely is not the man. Although when you look at serial offenders, most of them, that whatever their sexual impulse, that's what they attack. That, but that's not always the case. There are cases where homosexual or LGBT uh, type of serial killers will attack women. Dr. Brent Turvey looked at him and he saw, uh, he did not see sadosexual. He saw actually anger retaliatory, bitter hatred of, of women. And, you know, let Catherine Eddowes attack the face and especially um, Mary Kelly, where it was just ripped, it looked like the anatomical Venus, where you have, you know, the, the reclining Venus, which is the goddess of heterosexual love sitting there on a half shell, kind of 2000 years old. But the anatomical Venus at the time 
was a Venus, a sexy lady in a bed, and all the organs are separate. And of course, at the time, they were saying this is for medical use, but it was very sexy. And so you could see Tumblety loving that because here's the uh, uh, the goddess of heterosexual love just being mutilated. So it kind of looks like that. But in uh, the case with Tumblety, if if Dr. Turvey is right that it's anger retaliatory, and he said reassurance oriented because you could see the display going on, you could see taking of things to you know as trophies. That would be more of the reassurance oriented. Then that fits Tumblety to a T. So I would say, I would agree for the most part that if J Jack the Ripper was sadosexual, it would not have been tumbly. But to me, I see, you know, especially with uh, some experts saying anger, retaliatory hatred, bitter hatred, then that would fit tumbly because he had a bitter hatred of widow or maid. At some stage, we don't know exactly when, but it was probably in October, Tumblety was arrested in connection with the Whitechapel murders. The newspaper descriptions of several of the men who were taken into custody in London during October did bear a resemblance to him in one respect or another. However, it would seem that the police had no grounds on which to hold him and he was subsequently released, probably having convinced them that he was an upstanding citizen, a claim that he would always go prepared to back up on his sojourns into any slum district that he visited. In, uh, about 1900, 1901, in New Orleans... He hired a young man to write his letters and to work for him. And so, and that young man, like a number of them said that at night he would always go into the streets and he would go in the darkest areas of the streets where, where the prostitutes were. And that when he was there, he'd always have, um, that he would have um, cash in one pocket, jewelry in the other, never to mix. And so, uh, and what, one of the reasons he would do that is if he did get arrested, then he could show these police officers that he was uh, proof of his standing as the upper echelon person that he was just slumming it. On the 7th of November, 1888, he was arrested again on four counts of gross indecency and indecent assault with force of arms. This poses a problem with his having been Jack the Ripper because the murder of Mary Kelly took place two days later on the 9th of November, and if Tumblety was in custody at the time of her murder, then that would rule him out as having been the perpetrator. However, it is possible that Tumblety would have been granted bail on the 8th of November, as he would have appeared before a magistrate within 24 hours of his arrest. This would, of course, have seen him at liberty on the 9th of November, and for a narcissist like Tumblety, the indignation at his arrest would have been simmering within him. Anytime Tumblety gets uh, something that uh, he uh, arrested for something that he believes that wasn't his fault, that narcissism comes out, that's when I see a crime. And so, so I'm not surprised if, again, if he was the killer. So, again, I don't want to say 100% because he might not have been. But if he was, I'm not surprised it would have been November 9th because he was received into custody and arrested for gross indecency November 7th. And he was released by November 8th. So if there's a time that he's going to release that anger, it would have been that time. Tumblety was back in court on November the 14th when he appeared at Marlborough Street Police Court before Magistrate Mr Hannay, who committed him for trial at the Central Criminal Court or Old Bailey. Tumblety was, however, granted bail, which was posted on the 16th of November by two men who had only known him for a short period of time and Tumblety was then released from custody. His trial at the Central Criminal Court was scheduled for the 20th of November, but his lawyer managed to secure an adjournment to the 10th December, a delay that Tumblety took full advantage of by skipping bail and fleeing to France, from whence, on the 24th of November, he set sail for America under the assumed name of Frank Townsend. The British newspapers gave no mention at all to his arrest, but on the 17th of November, word of it was sent to America, and before he had even left England, the American newspapers had begun reporting that he had been arrested in connection with the Whitechapel murders. Well, the, the first time we realized that he was actually suspected was this New York World uh, cable transmission that came from London in November 17th, written by the New York World 
London correspondent E. Tracy Greaves. And in that, E. Tracy Greaves each week would get go to his uh, what he called his Scotland Yard informant, which he talked about in two separate times. And he would get an update on the Whitechapel murders. The article that appeared in the New York World and which was subsequently picked up by other American newspapers revealed that a man who gave his name as Dr. Cumblety of New York had been arrested in London in connection with the murders. The article went on to state that the police could not hold him on suspicion of the Whitechapel crimes, but they had committed him for trial at the Central Criminal Court under a special law passed soon after the modern Babylon exposures. This, incidentally, was referring to a controversial series of articles titled The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon that had appeared in the Pall Mall Gazette in July 1885, which had exposed the scandal of child prostitution in London and which had resulted in the passing of the Criminal Law Amendment Act in the August of that year. On the 19th of November, Patrick Crowley, the chief of the San Francisco police, learning of Tumblety's arrest, sent a message to the Metropolitan Police offering samples of Tumblety's handwriting. Three days later, Dr. Robert Anderson, the head of the Criminal Investigation Department, replied, Thanks. Send writing and all details you can in relation to him. Anderson, Scotland Yard. According to the New York Herald, the samples of his handwriting were wanted in order to compare them with the supposed writing of Jack the Ripper. In its edition of Saturday the 24th of November, the New York World, evidently not realising that Tumblety had that day set sail for America, reported that the London police had contacted Police Superintendent Campbell of Brooklyn for further information about Tumblety, who, so the article stated, they have under arrest on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper. Tumblety's ship arrived in New York at around 1.30 on the afternoon of Sunday the 2nd of December. Chief Inspector Thomas Burns, the head of detectives at the New York City Police Department, was aware that he was coming and he had sent Detective Sergeants Hickey and Crow to the docks to await him. He was one of the last passengers to leave the vessel, but eventually he came down the gangplank, got into a hack and headed off, with the two detectives following behind in a cab. Tumblety's destination was 79 East 10th Street, a boarding house run by an elderly Irish lady named Mrs. McNamara. It wasn't long before reporters began arriving outside her establishment in search of the fugitive, so much so that, according to the New York World, the bell of number 79 was kept merrily jingling all day long. The formidable Mrs. McNamara kept all inquirers at bay. She even went so far as to defend her lodger by telling a reporter that she had heard some of those awful stories about him, but, bless his heart, he would not hurt a chicken. Why, he never owed her a cent in his life, and once he had walked up three flights of stairs to pay her a dollar. Meanwhile, another reporter had managed to secure an interview with Chief Inspector Burns. The reporter began by asking Burns what his objective was in having Tumblety shadowed. I simply wanted to put a tag on him so we can tell where he is. Of course, he cannot be arrested, for there is no proof in his complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and the crime for which he was under bond in London is not extraditable. Do you think he is Jack the Ripper? the reporter pressed. I don't know anything about it, and therefore I don't care to be quoted. But if they think in London that they may need him, and he turns out to be guilty, our men will probably have a good idea where he can be found. As all this was playing out, the New York World reported that a new character appeared on the scene, and it was not long before he completely absorbed the attention of everyone. He was a little man with enormous red side whiskers and a smoothly shaven chin. He was dressed in an English tweed suit and wore an enormous pair of boots with soles an inch thick. He could not be mistaken in his mission. There was an elaborate attempt at concealment and mystery which could not be possibly misunderstood. Everything about him told of his business, from his little billy cock hat, alternately set jauntily on the side of his head and pulled lowering over his eyes, down to the very bottom of his thick boots. He was a typical English detective. Quite who this supposed detective was is uncertain. He may have been sent by Scotland Yard, or he may have been a private detective, 
but the reporters soon discovered that his interest was in Dr. Francis Tumblety. And so it was December uh, 3rd, the evening, where the reporters, they tried to talk to the detective, but he wouldn't speak. But what they did was they noticed that he was talking to the bartenders at the bar, which is across the street from his window. So by December 4th, in the paper, it talked, both papers had separate accounts of this British, or this English detective came over here to get the, the, the guy that done it, or as in the Whitechapel murders. And he's looking at Tumblety's window. So, so the, the question was, is, was he really a, a scout and air detective? Or some people were thinking that he might be somebody that uh, uh, maybe a private detective. But we have other accounts where uh, reports say that he was a scout and air detective. It should be remembered that although the American newspapers were busily linking Tumblety to the Whitechapel atrocities, they were stating unequivocally that he had not actually been charged with and was not wanted for complicity in the crimes. The charges against him were, as Chief Inspector Burns had stated, in connection with acts of gross indecency. However, this did not stop reporters locating and speaking with those who had known Tumblety and who were willing to testify to his misogynistic antecedents. William Pinkerton of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency told a reporter that People familiar with the history of the man always talked of him as a brute and as brutal in his actions. He was known as a thorough woman-hater and as a man who never associated or mixed with women of any kind. Pinkerton told another journalist that he thought Tumblety quite capable of the Whitechapel atrocities. Perhaps the most damning recollections of Tumblety around this time were those provided by Colonel C. S. Dunham, an attorney of Fairview, New Jersey, who, in an interview that was published in the Williamson's Daily Grit on Sunday the 9th December 1888, recalled how in 1861 he had attended an all-male dinner party that Tumblety had hosted. During the dinner, so Dunham recalled, someone asked why he had not invited some women to his dinner. His face instantly became as black as a thundercloud. He had a pack of cards in his hand, but he laid them down and said almost savagely, No, Colonel, I don't know any such cattle, and if I did, I would as your friend sooner give you a dose of quick poison than take you into such danger. He then broke into a homily on the sin and folly of dissipation, fiercely denounced all women, and especially fallen women. Dunham also claimed that Tumblety had shown his guests his collection of preserved uteri of all classes of women. Tumblety then revealed that the reason for his hatred of women was that, in his younger days, he had married a woman whom he had later discovered was a working prostitute, after which he had given up on womankind. All this was pretty damning stuff, but was, of course, little more than hearsay, and it should be pointed out that Dunham himself had a decidedly chequered past. He had been a spy and an agent provocateur during the American Civil War. He was a convicted perjurer, a fraudster, and a proven liar. According to one commentator, he was a man with few scruples who invariably acted in his own interest, no matter whose life he endangered or ruined. An acquaintance said of him that if his legal talent had equalled his talent for lying, he would have been one of the most successful lawyers of the age. So, in fairness to Tumblety, Dunham's character assassination of him should probably be taken with a pinch of salt. Around the 10th of December, Inspector Walter Andrews of the London Police arrived in Toronto, Canada, bringing with him Roland Barnett, who had been extradited from England and was charged with having contributed to the collapse of the Central Bank of Toronto. Having delivered his prisoner, Andrews headed to Montreal, arriving there on the 20th of December. Here, he had a meeting with George Hughes, the Chief of Police, after which he was questioned by reporters who wanted to know about the Whitechapel murders. He was quoted as responding that there were 23 detectives, two clerks and one inspector employed on the case, and that the police were without a jot of evidence on which to arrest anybody. There were reports in the press that Andrews had received orders from England to head to New York to commence his search there for the Whitechapel murderer. According to the Palmar Gazette on the 31st of December, 
The supposed inaction of the Whitechapel murderer for a considerable time and the fact that a man suspected of knowing a good deal about this series of crimes left England for this side of the Atlantic three weeks ago has produced the impression that Jack the Ripper is in that country. The timings mentioned by the article more or less tally with Tumblety's arrival in New York, so it is almost certain that he was the man being referred to. However, there is no proof that Andrews ever went to New York, and his mission in Toronto, according to a long and detailed article in the Toronto Mail on Thursday the 20th of December, was to collect evidence on Irish-American nationalists. Whatever Andrew's mission, and whether he ever did, as the Pall Mall Gazette suggested, go to New York, his quest to find Tumblety would have been a fruitless one, for, despite Inspector Burns's confident assertion to reporters that his men would probably have a good idea of where he could be found should the London police want to charge him with the Whitechapel murders, Tumblety had, in fact, managed to evade his watchers and had disappeared. And all the way even till the last couple, Two years ago, nobody knew where he went. But the nice thing about these local libraries digitizing their archives, Liber uh, the uh, Waterloo, New York, that small location, they digitized their newspapers. And I found this article that said, Francis Tumbley's in town. And by the way, there are these women getting accosted at night. So that was kind of interesting. But what, why that was a red flag to me is because I knew that his sister lived in Waterloo, New York, and under sworn testimony in 1905, that sister's son, uh, Thomas Powderly, said that when Tumbley was arrested for sodomy in, in Toronto, that's where he sneaked off to, to Waterloo, New York. And so that was 1881 or 1880. So this, you can see a pattern where Tumbley was sneaked off to his sister's. Tumblety resurfaced in January 1889 when he gave his interview to an American newspaper in which he told of how his arrest came about. The interviewer asked his opinion of the London police and his response was, to say the least, somewhat critical. I think their conduct in this Whitechapel affair is enough to show what they are. They stuff themselves all day with pot pies and beef and they drink gallons of stale beer keeping it up until they go to bed late at night and then wake up the next morning heavy as lead. Why, all the English police have dyspepsia. They can't help it. Then their heads are as thick as the London fogs. You can't drive an idea through their thick skulls with a hammer. I never saw such a stupid set. Look at their treatment of me. There was absolutely not one scintilla of evidence against me. I had simply been guilty of wearing a slouch hat, and for that I was held charged with a series of the most horrible crimes ever recorded. It is evident that Tumblety felt the injustice of his arrest keenly, and it is noticeable that, in the interview, he was protesting his innocence of the crimes he hadn't actually been charged with, the Whitechapel murders, whilst at the same time conveniently ignoring the crimes he had actually been charged with, acts of gross indecency. And by early January 1889, the newspapers, although still mentioning his arrest on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper, were also pointing out that he had not actually been charged with the crimes. But if he had committed the murders, what could his possible motivation have been? One of the things that he always did was that he, uh, to his young men, he would always warn them of, of women. He was Catholic and he would say that the women were the curse of the land. And uh, there were a couple cases, even with he uh, the letters uh, uh, for um, Henry Hall Cain. He, he, he comments on them. And he's basically being Catholic. It was not Adam that committed the original sin. It was Eve deceiving Adam. Therefore, women were the curse of the land. And many, and many Catholics believed that back then, even though that's not doctrine, but that's what many believed. And so here it is how Tumbledy would use that same phrase that the women were the curse of the land, including disease. And Tumbledy was born as a hermaphrodite. And, he's, and he, he told that Baltimore attorney that that was not a disease, but it was something negative, like a disease that, that has been plaguing me all my life, where he had a penis the size of the tip of his thumb and, and, um, and then all these different characteristics. So, so he blamed women for the curse of the land, although here it is, he's claiming that he can cure all disease. But what happened was in 1882, 
he started traveling to Hot Springs, Arkansas, which was the Mecca for syphilis. And so he claimed it was because of his rheumatism, but that sometimes was a euphemism for syphilis. So what happened was, is 1886, he started hanging out in New York City as a friend with a neurosurgeon. Uh, you, people uh, in the Ripper world heard of um, William Hammond, who made a comment about Jack the Ripper, his I thoughts, but his son was Graham Hammond, who was used as a, uh, in courts as an expert in paresis or paralysis of the insane, which both are diseases, and that's what, uh, it's basically neurosyphilis. So Graham Hammond was an expert in neurosyphilis. We have record of Tumblety with him or communicating, knowing him, befriending him, or being his patient, we don't know, but because Graham Hammond writes in his 1889 autobiography and 1893 autobiography, knowing him. Well, what happened was, is in the sworn depositions, they interviewed the doctor uh, in Hot Springs, and they asked him this question, what do you think was wrong with Tumblety? He says, uh, again, he's a doctor in Hot Springs, and his primary patients are syphilis patients. He says, uh, uh, it's his opinion that he had softening of the brain. And so Dr. William Hammond was the one that said uh, that softening of the brain was paresis or paralysis of the insane, which we now know as neurosyphilis. So we know that Tumbley knew he had syphilis in 1882. And a couple of years before the murders, he likely knew that he had neurosyphilis because in his 1889-1893 autobiography, here it is, a man that in his autobiography, he talks about all the the medical uh, uh, advances in his style. He only talked about three diseases. Keep in mind that the, the worst disease back then was consumption, uh, you know, tuberculosis. He doesn't talk about that at all. He talks about, he talks about kidney disease, heart disease, and paralysis. Those are the three that he talks about. That's it. And it's kind of like, oh, that matches the kidney, heart, and <laughs> well, not the uterus, but it's like, so why did he talk about paralysis? And then one of the things he talks about in paralysis is that the patients tend to get a red face. How many times have we talked about Tumbley having a, a rosy cheeks? It was all the time that he had rosy cheeks. And then some of the barbers in um, Hot Springs refused to do his hair, cut his hair because of the, they thought it was, he had sores that wouldn't heal. So they thought it was syphilic sores. So, but, uh, so it's, to me, it's clear that Tumbley had syphilis. And so if he, if he was the murderer, there was, again, he's blaming women for the curse of the land, not yet him, but now he's got an incurable disease that he can't do anything about. So if it was him, that narrow syphilis probably was messing with his brain. Because remember, about a few years later, by 1895, 1995, he never wears anything nice. He, wears, he looks like a, a hobo for the rest of his life even though he had $3 million in the New York bank of today's value. He dressed as a homeless person for the rest of his life. Thereafter, Tumulty's name appeared only sporadically in the newspapers. On the 18th of November, 1890, for example, he was arrested by a detective Horn in Washington and charged with being a suspicious person. Horn, so he later testified, had become suspicious of Tumulty when he had seen him in the company of two young men so it is likely that the reason for his arrest was on similar grounds to the offences that he had been arrested for in London two years previous. In court the next day, Tumblety testified that he was simply waiting for a car at 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue when he heard two young men talking about New York. He began conversing with them, whereupon Detective Horn came along, stopped near them, and then arrested him. Tumblety emphatically denied the charge against him and, true to form, he denounced his arrest as a shocking outrage. Under cross-examination, he denied that he was ever charged with a similar offence in England. He said that some newspapers attempted to say that he was Jack the Ripper, but that was a silly statement to which he paid no attention. The judge reluctantly dismissed the case against him. Thereafter, Tumblety managed to largely keep out of the media's spotlight. Indeed, according to a newspaper report that appeared following his death, as he aged, he developed a reticence about himself and his affairs that almost amounted to a mania. 
On April the 26th, 1903, a Mr. Frank Townsend engaged a room at St. John's Hospital, St. Louis, telling the staff that he considered it a convenient place to die. Townsend was, of course, the alias under which Tumblety had fled London in November 1888. Gradually, according to the St. Louis Republic, the malady from which he was suffering developed to a serious stage, and calling for a lawyer in order to dictate his will, Mr. Townsend revealed his true identity as Dr. Tumblety. On Monday the 25th of May, he asked to be dressed, saying that he would like to go out for a walk. An attendant was assigned to assist him, but Tumblety insisted on going out on his own. After walking about the streets for some time, he returned to the hospital and sat on the steps of the building. Whilst sitting there, he dozed off and fell forward on his face, breaking his nose and receiving a shock from which he never recovered. He died on Thursday the 28th of May, 1903, and was buried in a family grave at the Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Rochester, New York. He left a fortune of more than $100,000. Among his possessions when he died were two cheap brass rings, which some commentators have claimed may have been the rings that were missing from Annie Chapman's fingers at the time of her murder. However, there is no actual proof that they were. Francis Tumblety is an intriguing suspect. He is one of the only major suspects who was arrested at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders in connection with the crimes. He was most certainly a charlatan and a narcissist, and in many respects he wasn't a particularly pleasant character. By his own admission, he was in Whitechapel at the time of the murders, and he even admitted that he had been arrested in connection with the Jack the Ripper crimes. Yet, it must be remembered that the police had insufficient evidence to actually prosecute him for the crimes, and the offences that he was charged with were to do with acts of gross indecency. Chief Inspector Burns and Chief Inspector Littlechild, as well as all the American newspapers that covered the story, all stated this to be the case, and Burns appears to have been so certain that Tomlety was not the Whitechapel murderer that he laughed at the suggestion that he was. There was most certainly a degree of homophobia in the press coverage of his arrest, as well as in the comments made about him by the likes of William Pinkerton and Colonel Dunham. This is also evident in Little Child's letter to Sims, in which he mentioned Tumblety's arrest for unnatural offences, and described him as a psychopathia sexualis, a reference to Richard von Kraft Ebbing's 1886 pioneering psychological study of sexual behaviour, notable for being one of the earliest works on male homosexuality. It is also worth noting that Little Child appears to contradict himself in the letter to Sims, writing that, although Tumblety was amongst the suspects, and to Little Child's mind a very likely one, he was not known as a sadist, which the murderer unquestionably was. Little Child did write that Tumblety's feelings towards women were remarkable and bitter in the extreme, and he also pointed out that following Tumblety's disappearance from London, the Ripper murders came to an end, so he evidently considered Tumblety a viable suspect. Unfortunately, as is the case with so many of the suspects, we do not have access to the evidence that led the police to arrest him in connection with the Whitechapel murders. Perhaps it was included on the large dossier concerning Tumblety that Little Child claimed was kept at Scotland Yard. But up until now, no researcher has ever had the opportunity to access and study that dossier, and we don't even know if it still exists, or, for that matter, if it ever did exist. Thus, Dr. Francis Tumblety remains a major contender for the mantle of having been Jack the Ripper, and although we don't know why he was suspected, the fact remains that at some stage in the investigation he was suspected. However, there is one mystery about Tumblety that might have been solved following his death. His prominent black moustache was one of his most notable features, and it is commented on time and time again in newspaper articles about him. In the widely circulated portrait of him, it appears to be extremely exaggerated to the point of almost being a costume prop. Was it real? Well, when the undertaker popped it right off. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> when the undertaker cleaned off all the black wax, 
pitch white, white, and it just popped right. <laughs> so I don't know why it popped right off, but it popped right off. So I don't know how, what you could say, but that's what they said. He said in his uh, sworn deposition. Do you think Francis Tumblety was Jack the Ripper, or do you favour another suspect? Cast your vote in our online poll at whowasjack.com. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and please be sure to hit the subscribe button for updates on other videos on Jack the Ripper and the Whitechapel murders.